By the time I was 14, I was already over six foot. I was too tall. I was too thin. My nose was too big. I grew my hair long because part of not knowing how to fit in meant going out of my way to not fit in. I needed something or someone to show me how to feel part of something. It was the end of the 70s. Watching late night television, some video show hosted by Tony Tennille. I heard this music and instantly I was under the influence. The sound made me sit straight up on the couch. My foot went into a manic stomp, a manic stomp, as the drum hammered out a beat. The guy singing, he didn't look like, he didn't look like any other singer I'd ever seen before. He must have been like seven foot easy. No open suede shirt or macrame pants. He wore a leather motorcycle jacket. His hair was long hanging in his eyes. Not coiffed or that feathered cut that, that was just like in that sticks fit video that I just suffered through. <laughs> Somehow he looked to me like my future. He was Joey Ramone. <laughs> the very next morning, I jumped on a bus for downtown to go to the record store. Looking at the album cover, I thought that Joey could be Joey could be the drummer or the guitarist, but he didn't he didn't quite fit the bill of the classic rock band singer. At the time in my high school, if you weren't listening to Led Zeppelin, then you were a fag. <laughs> now don't get me wrong, Led Zeppelin is a good band, talented. But come on you guys, the lyrics singing about goblins and bubbling cauldrons and goblins and magic, what, come on. <laughs> None of that spoke to me. What I did like about this new band that I found was, was the words. Now I want to sniff some glue. <laughs> All the kids want something to do. Now I want to sniff some glue. <laughs> that spoke to me. I started to embrace my new attitude and my appearance. Maybe it was the holes in my jeans, the bad grades I was getting, or the hair in my face that led my father to try an intervention of sorts. After months and months of my dad screaming, I'll keep in mind my dad's from Liverpool. David, you need to cut that bloody hair! <laughs> he wanted to let me know. He was trying to understand his son and guide me through my awkward teen times. My dad asked me if I wanted to go on a trip with him to New York City, just the two of us on a father and son weekend. This was like asking some kid who wanted to be an astronaut if he would like to go to space camp. <laughs> New York City? Of course I agreed, but I said, yeah, Dad, that sounds cool, I guess. <laughs> it was my best I don't care tone. We left upstate New York and we flew into JFK. Our first day was on a Circle Line ferry tour of Manhattan that was highlighted for me by the burnt out Cadillacs I saw beached on the shores of the East River. The New York City skyline was even more magnificent once you get inside its belly. Walking the avenues with my dad, my neck on a constant rotation, looking in every direction for one thing. All I wanted, all I wanted was a glimpse of Joey Ramone in his own habitat. <laughs> maybe he'd be hailing a cab or feeding some pigeons in the park or maybe he's out jogging, I don't know. <laughs> he had to be here somewhere. How hard could it be to find my idol in a city of millions on a father and son weekend? <laughs> it turns out, not so hard. While wandering the waterfront that afternoon after our boat ride, my dad and I were walking along when suddenly I heard a sound I had heard through my stereo speakers at home so many times before. It was a guitar chord being struck with just the right smattering of feedback behind it. Then, a microphone voice of Dee Dee Ramone. Want that, that, bop? <laughs> Which to me is nothing short. It's like a German soldier launching a grenade. <laughs> like a dog chasing a silent whistle, I took off in the direction of the music. <laughs> I, I must have ran at least two, three blocks before stopping. Suddenly, my face pressed against a graded fence. 
I pushed my hair back and I zeroed in on a stage just 100 feet away. It was them. I was beside myself. Wait a minute, how come there's no crowd here? Did, did my dad plan this as a special surprise for me? <laughs> Is this like my birthday Christmas gift? <laughs> did my dad pay the Ramones to play while we strolled along the pier? <laughs> Holy shit, this rules. My illusion was shattered when I heard my father running up behind me. He had been chasing me for at least two or three blocks. David, don't you bloody run off like that again! <laughs> Before I could catch my breath, they left the stage. This was just a sound check they were doing for a show that night. I pleaded to go to the show, but we already had tickets to go to, go to Rodney Dangerfield's that night. <laughs> that was a good time, too. Me and my dad, we had a blast. <laughs> a blast. Monday morning, back at school, I got a reality check when this kid, looking at my notebook, where I had emblazed Ramon's rule, asked very seriously, who the hell are the Ram Ones? <laughs> now I was only encouraged to get the hell out of this town. By the time I was 20 years old, I ran away to New York City with only one objective. I was going to be a Ramon. It just seemed logical. <laughs> In a crowded bar called Club 86, it's across the street from the Hells Angels Clubhouse. Standing in the distance was a tall shadow, standing like a giant praying mantis. I readjusted my gaze, and the tall, dark figure came into focus. Without, without a doubt, I confirmed it. It was Joey Ramone. And it was this moment where everything else, everything else just stopped. I could no longer hear the loud music blasting through the bar, nor did I even care about the people I was bumping into as I ran within 15 feet of my Messiah, my savior, my goddamn hero. I made myself stop running and take stock of the whole situation because the last thing I wanted to do was rush this guy. <laughs> I took a breath and I whispered to myself, what would Joey Ramon do? Very, very slowly, I put my elbow on the bar next to him. I let a few moments elapse before even glancing at this guy, the guy that I had spent the last dozen years of my formative life studying on records and posters and every fanzine ever printed. Now, now I'm inches away, fighting for the words to use. In slow motion, I watch Joey's arm reach out to my face, push back my long bangs, I covered my eyes, and he said, Hey, my name's Joey. How are you? Yeah. God damn it, I know who you are, I screamed. <laughs> In my head. <laughs> but what I said out loud, oh, My name's David. How are you? <laughs> Joey snapped his finger at the bartender who ran over, despite being too busy to get anyone else a drink that night. I sip my drink with anticipation as to how this is even happening right now. We talked and we laughed. I asked questions and he really listened. We were, we were like a couple of pen pals meeting for the first time. I was totally engaged in epic conversation about everything. I was ecstatic. Joey and I uh, continued our conversation into the VIP lounge of this club. At one point, Joey reached into his jacket and he pulled out a folded piece of glossy paper. That could only be one thing. Joey asked me if I wanted to do some cocaine. <laughs> well, he didn't really ask me. He just assumed that we had this other thing in common. <laughs> he was absolutely correct. <laughs> the, candle, the candle on the table illuminated Joey's face as he leaned in to do a parcel of powder up his nose. His nose, his nose was peppered with gin blossoms from drinking so much. I tried to discount this because I idolized this man, warts and all. I love this guy. A big burly bouncer in an ill-fitting suit dived in 
and with one breath, he blew away the rest of the cocaine into the smoky air. No more, Mr. Ramon, you've been warned before. <laughs> Joey leaned into me and he said, come on, David, we're getting 86 from Club 86. <laughs> it was 4 a.m. in New York City, and there's still plenty of shit you can do in this city. <laughs> Joey made a suggestion. Let's go to save the robots. Pretty soon, we're surrounded by girls in this new club. And what does Joey do? He starts telling these girls, oh, hey, this is David. He's in my band. <laughs> I could have died right there. <laughs> died really, really happy. <laughs> we left the club, me, Joey, and two French girls. We headed back to my place around the corner. At my apartment, I had Joey sign all my Ramones posters in my room. <laughs> I was here, I really was, he wrote. <laughs> without, me asking, without me asking, Joey gave me his phone number. I realized how kids feel when they get sponsored by the Make-A-Wish Foundation. <laughs> Maybe they get to play catch with the Yankees. <laughs> this was a great time in any kid's life that ever heard music that made them feel 10 feet tall and alive. Soon I found something else that I thought made me feel 20 feet taller and, and, and barely alive. This is the same year that I began my romance with heroin. Soon, all the things in my life that mattered got diluted into a syringe, my, my friends and my family. The worst, thing, the worst thing a junkie does, and they do a lot of shitty things, is that while I might be getting this euphoric high, some of the time, my family, they got nothing. I get numbed, and they get it with zero anesthetic. And my dad took it the worst at times. I became a textbook example of what, what you don't want your kid to be. My stints in jail were really the only place where at least my dad knew I was safe. I sat on the bunk thinking about the last conversation my dad and I had where he said, you're not welcome here anymore. I don't want to see you. This is, this is after him giving me too many second chances. The day came, and it did, and I did manage to get clean. And there's a lot of things you do. <laughs> there's a lot of things you go through to get your life back, and there's a lot of things I started to do again. The first one was I started to listen to Ramones again. That's what you got to do. <laughs> I started to play the drums again. I ran a marathon in a Ramones T-shirt. Because <laughs> you got to do things like that. <laughs> I even got married, and I insisted on having a Ramones song played as we walked down the aisle. That marriage didn't last, but <laughs> but the sound of the Ramones in a church chapel was fucking cool. Yeah. Last summer, my dad got cancer, and I don't think I don't think we were on the best of terms when I heard this. And it wasn't like this magic piece came over us just because I got clean and or because of the c word either. I would. I would go with my dad to his chemotherapy appointments a few times a week. My dad's illness progressed and my assistance was needed more each day. One day, while going to his chemo, I heard my dad say something really inappropriate in a crowded hospital elevator. Did that bloody doctor even speak English? <laughs> now I learned how to laugh and not get embarrassed by my dad because my dad could do whatever he wanted to. He's not perfect. He'd done a ton of right stuff for me. He's great. As the cancer got deeper, his need for my help, it, it really grew. And my dad has always been a tough guy. The Nazis bombed his house during the war. He's always been a tough guy. and he's, he, he wasn't always receptive to admitting his, his pain or his defeat. And then my dad needed heavy narcotics to ease his, his, his body and, and his pain. And I never imagined my past apprenticeship with, with, with drugs and syringes would ever be beneficial for, for anything until somebody, somebody you really love needs you. I could do that. I could help you with that. I became my father's pain reliever, not just through 
dosing him with morphine, but through my opportunity to hold his hand. Well, he looked in my eyes, and I felt, I felt forgiven for everything. Never felt so comforted. In the, next few, in the final few days of my dad's life, he noticed me in my Ramon's shirt. <laughs> I wear it all the time. And he said to me with the utmost sincerity, I want a bloody Ramon shirt too, David. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to ask my dad just two facts about what he knows about me, he would say, well, David loves the Ramones <laughs> and he loves his bloody dad. Ladies and gentlemen, the ineffable David Latham.